start. Okay, hello and hi everybody. We have another meetup today and today we have two wonderful guests. We have Patricia Kang and Ravi Verma. Yay! And today we're going to have... Yay! Sorry. Yeah. And, <laughs> and today we're going to have an open discussion, an open Q&A. So we encourage you to ask your question and also share your thoughts, share your ideas, share your own stories. And we're going to talk about how to avoid burned, uh, burnout and about the mental resilience in a workplace. Before we start, uh, we're gonna share some, uh, a bit of presentation about our initiative, and then we're gonna start with the topic, okay? Artem. Yeah, um, I'll try to do it fast, but yep. not promise. So <clears throat> yeah, our initiative called Agile with Ukraine because me from Ukraine and Andre from Ukraine, and we are both from Agile World, <laughs> and we were thinking how can we help our country right now? And we are doing what we can do the best, uh, meaning take people who have what to share and want to share some knowledge, expertise, uh, wisdom, and those who want to uh, continuously learn and uh, learn from the best agile experts from around the globe. And we organize this marathon of uh, never ending meetups. And now they are free, but we are preparing some surprises for you. So we are doing this not only to connect people, but also to collect donations to support Ukraine in this war. And we are collaborating with one fund. We will tell about it a bit later. But now I want to share some news uh, for those who are not reading uh, media and not watching TV every day. And we do believe that uh, Ukraine is not so popular as the first weeks of war on the media of Western countries, more Westerns than we are. So we want to focus you a bit on not so funny moments of our life nowadays, but show you that we are fighting and we are continue uh, our attempts to go back to normal life as soon as it will be possible. So you can see the Kiev at the second day of war. So someone thinking still that uh, they are fighting only with military troops and military objects, but without, declare, without declaring a war, they have hit it with missile the absolutely residential building five kilometers from city center in Kyiv, capital of Ukraine, uh, just at the very beginning. And uh, this is what they did to Kharkiv, and this was the biggest square in Europe one of the biggest uh, cities of Ukraine. This is Chernigiv, one of the oldest city in Ukraine, and that is Sumy, also nearby borders. And uh, this was the world largest, only one in the world, uh, transport aircraft Maria, uh, created by Ukrainian engineers, and now it's almost fully ruined. But after the city was cleaned up from Russian invaders, our engineers were successful to launch uh, one of the, how to say, turbines. So it, our Maria is still partially alive. And <clears throat> this is uh, one of the newest and biggest in Europe shopping mall, almost uh, fully destroyed by missiles in the residential district with about, I believe, 50,000 people living around it. And it's very personal for me because the flat of my grandma is just five, three, five hundred meters from this shopping mall. Thanks God she is okay. She wasn't there. We've evacuated her, but it's really dangerous for civilians to stay in the city while it was bomb while it was bombed by Russians. This is one of the newest business center in the city center of Kyiv, just opened last year, almost fully ruined. Uh, nearby underground station Lukyanivska city center also. This is a few pictures from Chernigiv. So one newest residential building, the central stadium of their football team uh, almost ruined <coughs> and uh, even bookshelf. But uh, as you can see, bookshelf uh, is still there and fighting for her future and ready to stay and keep calm in this situation. It's local ma'am. And <laughs> this is Mariupol, still under siege and um, in occupation half of the city, more than half, 70% of the city is under occupation and they are bombing and shelling everything around. So city is almost fully destruct destructed. This is Bucha. I believe that a lot of you have heard a lot about Bucha, but we don't want to show you bloody pictures because we will be like suspended on YouTube and you can find it by your own if you want by this uh, hashtag. 
but we can show you some pictures of buildings. And this is Barodyanka, next uh, village nearby Bucha. And this is Kramatorsk. Uh, missile was launched to railway station. And 4,000 people were waiting for evacuation, agreed by Green Corridor between Ukraine and Russia before this, day before. So they were know that there will be a lot of families with children and elder people. And they launched a missile just in the uh, railway station. Um, <clears throat> I'll switch a bit uh, context. Uh, so this is a place where families can spend some weekends before the war. It's the end of January and this is my family. This is my daughter. This is my wife and son and my dog. And it was a nice place, 25 kilometers from Kiev, Dobro Park. And on the right picture, you can see the residential of Santa Claus. So you can write a mail to him with your wishes and what they did to this beautiful place. They just transform it to usual Russian terrain and landscape so they can feel more like at home. But we will definitely rebuild it soon. Thanks God that people are not affected in this area in this particular area, but in all other areas it's not so bright. And this is Zakhar, the boy from Bucha originally, now he is hiding in western part of Ukraine, in Zakarpatia. And he is drawing, he like an art, uh, he is a young artist, he likes to draw. And he drawn Ukrainian soldiers who are trying to push out the Russian army from Ukraine territory. He is 11 years old, as I said. And he is a part of uh, another project, uh, UA Kids Today, we are we have created with my wife at the 5th of March. If you want to see more pictures of wars through the kids' eyes, you can go by this tag in Facebook or Instagram and support our project also. <clears throat> and this is Ukrainian people. They're going back to their houses and helping to clean up the streets. And they have a lot of work to do to clean up the streets because the streets of their cities looks like this right now. And this garbage of uh, lastings of Russian army should be cleaned up because people want to live in their city, clean city, prospect perspective, beautiful cities. And uh, our developers are still working. They are not planning like to hide and cry all over the day because people here are very courage, open and committed as in Scrum values. And they want to deliver value and to create future instead of uh, fighting for the past, you know. And we are fighting here not only for Ukraine, we are fighting for the whole Europe. We are fighting for freedom, we are fighting for democracy and that's why thanks to Polish people, Latvian, Lithuanian, Slovenian, Great Britain people, US people, for all this support it's highly appreciated and it's really needed so we can stand for this ground and not let this, uh, I don't know how to call it correctly, but this kind of human beings go further and start war on different territories and war is not so far, yeah, it's not that far. We are in the center of Europe and we are fighting for all humanity, I believe. <laughs> Maybe it sounds too, 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 too loud, but that's what I, how I feel it. And to support Ukraine together with Andri and uh, Ravi and other co-organizers of this initiative, we are collaborating with Uniters Foundation and Andri will tell you about this a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, right at the beginning, and, and uh, I also th uh, thank Sartan for highlighting that Ravi is also one of the co of co-organizers of our initiative. And Ravi did uh, a lot and a great job to, to help us from the beginning until now. Yep, yeah. so right at the beginning when we, uh, when we thought of it, uh, of a format, we thought with whom should we cooperate? Should we create a separate fund or should we maybe some, uh, find uh, some people who are already doing that for, uh, for the long time and they would be better than us into providing help to Ukraine? And uh, it came to uh, actually to my memory that in 2014, when, um, when Russia invaded Ukraine for the first time, uh, by the annexion of Crimea and also by starting the war uh, in Donbas, there was at that time a pretty small foundation, which was at that time called uh, the he Heroes of Maidan Initiative, because we had a revolution. And right after that, they changed their name to Uniter. So, but they, by that time, it was a pretty small foundation. And for eight long years, they grew, they uh, enriched their um, connections and partnership with other foundations, with other people. And right now we have a pretty big international foundation, which is called United, that's been supporting 
uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian people and Ukrainian army for eight long years. So just think of the numbers. When the full-scale war started from the 24th of February, the first cargo went from Poland to Ukraine from that foundation on the 26th of, uh, of February, so less than two days. And from since that time, they delivered more than 3,050 tons of help to Ukraine. It's around 100 tons per day. It's enormous. And we asked them, how can we help? And what they, what, what they said is that we, our people, they know how to find stuff. We know how to buy stuff. We know how to verify stuff. The only thing we need is a stable income of money so we can be effective. And this is what we're trying to do with that initiative. We're trying to connect people with knowledge with those who are looking to be better, to, to, to have more knowledge. We're raising awareness about what's going on in Ukraine and we're also collecting money to help Ukraine. So there are two ways how you can donate and all of the links will be also in the chat. So you can donate via PayPal and also uh, via the Polish website, zrutka.pl. And we thank you very much for your attention and for your donations. Okay, okay. So maybe now it's time to talk about mental resilience and how to avoid a burnout in a place. Yep, so today, as I mentioned already, we have Ravi Verma and uh, Patricia Kong. So guys, may maybe we can start with a short introduction of you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I can do the introduction, but I think the better one would be uh, would be from you as well. So, Patricia. Oh, I was going to pass it to my elder first. <laughs> Ravi, would you like to go first? All right. Patricia gives me a lot of grief about my age. Uh, <laughs> so I knew it's helping I you to build the mental resilience, Ravi. <laughs> yes, I think one of the reasons I'm. Uh, uh, I have more experience with burnout is my long association with Patricia Kong. <laughs> she is one of the biggest reasons <laughs> why I burn out and I need resilience. Uh, but jokes apart, uh, I, I'm a scrum.org professional scrum trainer. I'm originally from India. I've been in the uh, US for a while, 20 plus years. And uh, um, during the day, I uh, my passion is uh, building organizations where people come to work, do something fulfilling and go home with a smile on their face to their families or whoever might be waiting. That's my true north. Uh, and that's who I am. Trish, over to you. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm Patricia Kong and um, my relationship to Ravi is that he is this thorn in my side, <laughs> yet he is also, he's, He's Thor on my side, but he challenges me. He's, he's challenged me. Uh, we've been friends for, for quite a while to, to be better. So he's, he is that person who is like a supportive message on the phone um, when, you know, when the days are, are long or whatever that is. And he's also the asshole who tells me, Patricia, you know what a really good dish is? Go microwave your ice cream for 30 seconds. It's delicious. And, and he has me do things like that. So <laughs> we have that type of relationship. And I, I appreciate sharing this space with him and with all of you. Um, I've been at Scrum.org for over 10 years and I, um, I started my career um, actually out studying organizational behavior and then thinking about that in financial services. Um, I worked in, at Forrester Research and then I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. I used to live in France. Um, so I was in Paris and working in startups and tech and marketing that way. And then uh, came back to, to Boston where I am, am now. And so, um, a lot of the things that I, I work on and my body of work is around enterprise agility and leadership, evidence-based management scaling. Um, and naturally where that's really driven me and the you know, pandemic and all these things when I'm just looking at myself is to really think about human behavior again and organizational behavior. So, so it, it makes me think about feelings, which I'm not comfortable with, um, which is why we're doing this. <laughs> So uh, a couple of words, uh, th thanks guys. Uh, a couple of words about the format. So it's gonna be an open discussion. So you are more than welcome to unmute yourselves, to turn your cameras on and actually to, uh, to participate in our discussion. 
uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to avoid a burnout and mental resilience. One disclaimer that we have to make is that none of us are therapists. None of us can give like an, uh, you know, uh, doctor advice. You should do that. We're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to just share like our insights, our stories, uh, our approaches, how we deal with that. Okay. Cool. And maybe, maybe we can start, we can start by first thing. So look, burnout, mental resilience, those are pretty low pretty loud terms and pretty big terms. Maybe we should, at the beginning, establish how do we understand it? How do we define it? So what is a burnout and what is the mental resilience for you guys? I don't know. Let's start with Ravi now, and he will pass to Patricia. Or... <laughs> and if you guys have questions or want to chime yeah. in, please just unmute yourself or put it in the in the um, chat box. Yeah. And and my, you know, my request is, I, I want to add to what Andre said, that we are not experts in this area. I feel like I'm I'm 47 years old, and I feel like I'm I'm a very quick learner. It's after 47 years, I feel I'm starting to get a very small understanding of my architecture, my design, uh, and I feel I've got like one percent understanding. But this percentage may go down tomorrow. So I think my stance is I want to be vulnerable, and I want to share all the mistakes I made in my life and what I'm starting to understand about myself. And my hope is not that what has worked for me will work for you, but rather it may spark an insight that may help you get a breakthrough in your context. And so Patricia and I, what would make us feel this time was well spent is if you share your question and your story, so that we tailor our answers to a unique question or situation you're facing. So that's my request. We want you to get value from this conversation. Uh, I'll tell you about burnout uh, and please tell me to stop if I'm boring you. The first time I experienced burnout was, uh, I was a delivery manager, um, like a you know, dev manager. I was releasing software, my team was releasing software and we would have a major release and it would be it would be very challenging. Like this is back in the waterfall day. And after we pushed and shoved and got a release out for many days, sometimes even weeks, I just didn't feel like going to work. And I didn't know what the heck is happening to me. I got uh, symptoms in my body when I started thinking of going to work. It's almost like nausea or there's a tightening in my stomach. Don't feel like looking at email. I just crashed. And it took me a while. And then slowly the energy started coming back. And I... I didn't even know if that was the name burnout, but I started noticing the leading indicators and then the crash happened. And I, I, there's nothing I could do. I could not create a Gantt chart and come out of it fast. Once it happens, I'm at the mercy of my body and it works on its own timetable, its own schedule. So that has, for me, that's when I, how I define burnout. Burnout is like, almost feel like throwing up when it comes to work. I'm not, I would love to get through it fast, but I have no insight into what the heck is going on in my code. I can't single step. I can't debug the code. The architecture will take as much time as it needs. All I know is if I try to force it, it will take twice as much or thrice as much. But if I let it go, I'll come out of it sooner. So anyway, that's how I define burnout. I'm not a psychiatrist. I, this is not a technical definition. That's how I interpret it. Um, let me let me try try to think about it from another way because it's, there's a, there might be a slight difference for when you're just like, am I really burned out? Is something, is something, is something going on here? Or is it just like, you know, kind of, I'm stressed, shit's hitting the fan. So how many of you feel stressed? You just raise your hand. Right. And, and then how many of you think that you are, are burnt out? And so there might be this question of what's the difference between stress and burnout that we could think about because how, if you don't control that stress or you don't start to recognize it, that would lead to a burnout. And so a, a stress, when I think about stress, it's like, I'm really stressed, stuff is going down, I gotta shake it. And it's like, there's so much I could do, I just wanna fight, I just wanna fight, right? And burnout is when you are, for me, 
very detached. Like I can't even get up. I can't even don't, don't even bother. I don't care. I don't know what to do. I don't, I, I don't know how to move forward. I don't know how to move backwards. I don't know how to get through that. And I think that for me, that's, that's really where if you don't control the stress, those factors, whether it be from the outside world, the war, um, your mother-in-law, whatever it is, those things that keep burdening you around family and you know, there's the wheel of life, those things, if you don't examine them, that can really lead to this burnout. Um, and if you don't think about those places where you can improve, you're only going to spiral. So that's really how I think about that connection because it's, it's, a, it's a real thing to be burnout and the depression that it causes and, and those things. And it's become a very real conversation um, in organizations about how much they would invest in this and how do we invest in each other in communities to, to get through them. No, I'll add something to that because why not? Um, I live in a perpetual state of stress. Um, and actually, at times, it's not a bad thing. I mean, it, I know there's a lot of research, a lot of things about the, uh, the health impacts of stress. And I think there's different degrees of stress. I push myself on very tight deadlines. I tend to function best when I'm up against the deadline. If I've got six weeks to do something, I'll leave it till I've got six hours to do it because for some reason I, I function better like that. Um, but that keeps me in this perpetual state of, of hyper focus and it is stress. And at times it becomes overwhelming. And I know it's becoming overwhelming when I'm no longer actually able to, to function and create a little bit what you were saying, Trish, is that you get to the point where I just can't function anymore. I, can, I mean, I'll sit and stare at the screens in front of me or the work I'm working on. Uh, and then I've just, but I've, I've now trained myself because I'm older than you, Ravi, by a few years. Um, but I've, I've trained myself now. I just look better. That's all. But you don't look it like it, Nigel. I <laughs> know. Oh, thanks, Trish. I appreciate that. Um, but um, I can't grow a great moustache like Ravi. That's the difference. I struggle to grow any, any decent beards or anything. But no, so I get to the point where I'm su super, super overwhelmed. And then I actually have trained myself to recognize that a little now. And I walk away, I go sit down, I watch TV, I'll go, I even go get in bed and have a sleep, you know, or, and I may even walk away for something for two or three days and go back to it. And actually, I find when I go back to it, I'm, I'm super refreshed and I can actually function more. I, I will say that to my wife's horror, I work very well when I'm listening to dubstep at high volume. I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Music. <laughs> hey everyone, this is Manish here. Apologies uh, to some issue, I cannot uh, open my camera. So uh, what I felt uh, about stress, anxiety, everything is, at times maybe we can correlate with too much of a work because too much of a things to be doing. But at times I feel that it is also because of when things are not going the way you wanted them to go. Taken an example of, you know, you wanted to do either a transformation or you wanted to have certain, you know, things to happen or ceremonies to happen in a certain way. Maybe your near and dear one to be behave the way you want them to be, but they do not. So I believe these are also such situation where uh, it's not something you are exhausting physically or mentally, but it is something you are you are thinking too much, which is which is something allowing you to get exhausted, feel stressed, and ultimately it is getting into burnout. So any, any thought suggestion, if you would have felt the similar situation, any thought suggestion on, on this? Oh, Mr. Um, Ravi wants, wants to give his insight, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, Trish, why don't you go first? Okay. I think, I think that there's, um, and you're, you're, there, there's definitely that, right? Manish, like when you talk about a transformation, an agile transformation, it can be, first of all, it should never, uh, it rarely goes, <laughs> it rarely goes the way you run it. As a matter of fact, the first thing you should do is just cancel it. But the thing that is really interesting and in what you're saying is this notion almost around planning and perfection. So Let's yes. talk about a, 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 a scrum event. You come in and you say sprint planning, we've done refinement, we've done all these things, everybody's ready, we come in. And you get into this meeting and within 10 minutes you have all the stuff and somebody goes, we didn't refine that enough. I don't agree with this goal. We can't have those things. And it's just, it's, it's really tiring, right? Because it's kind 
kind of like you've, you've tried to yep. do all these things to set up a perfect environment. And I really feel like that's where this reflection on how we can be better coaches in this and, and look deeper into ourselves and say, why the fuck aren't they just doing what we all know we're supposed to do? Everybody here is at the same skill level and kind of explore those dynamics of what is missing and almost let them go through those things is, is what I have taken years to get to and continuously reflecting on that. And I am very, tr you know, I, the, the notion of being reactive is something that I've had to work through mm -hmm. and how did I do that? Um, Alana, you were, you're asking me some of those different things is really through um, curiosity, like this whole thing about curiosity and just getting curious of why are people acting um, in certain ways? Why do I act this certain way? And being a little bit more humble and letting go of some of my own garbage, but also like physical activity. Any, anything mm -hmm. like, like what Nigel was talking about, things where I have to just kind of get that energy out and then come back to it to see if I have a different perspective now. Okay. Does that help? Yes, I will definitely give it a try. Try to let my energy go. Try to see, I, I understand. I definitely agree with one thing that's more of my reaction than someone else's reaction. It is way how I am reacting to it or how can I improve my reaction or simply let it go. Don't have any reaction. Let it go. Yeah, I don't know if it's don't have any reaction too because we're human, right? That's what's kind of fun. Um, but I think Ravi has done, Ravi, you would, I would love to hear what you say, especially with your um, investment that you've made in yourself with a lot of the, the coactive um, coaching. And, and you know what, I'm saying this and it sounds really beautiful, but it's like, yes, do I drink too much? Do I eat too much? Do I work out too much? Do I also, you know, have a coach and have people that speak with me and, and I, I talk about all these things? Yes. And that is, that is a lot of effort and foundation to help me, you know, let go and also have an outlet. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I want to add my thoughts. I, as a practitioner, so what I do for a living, what I have been trying to do for 12 years is organizational change, mm -hmm. agile training, coaching, transformation. And here's one thing that I learned. Uh, I, I use a four, a four quadrant model on myself to inspect when I'm starting to get burned out, what is, uh, what exactly is lacking in my life? And how do I do a surgical intervention to provide what I'm missing? Like if I'm a child, there's a child inside of me. And if I'm a parent and my child is unhappy, I want to be a better parent to my inner child uh, so that I can be a better parent to my, my children. And the first question I ask is, what is lacking? And there's a model that I use. Uh, and I'm going to use an analogy. So I have a, I have a printer. And my printer, let's say, has got four cartridges. I don't have a black cartridge, but suspend your disbelief, right? So there is, there is magenta, yellow, cyan. Just imagine this is black. So when I print something, if one of the cartridges is running low on my taskbar, there's an error mm -hmm. message that pops up. Cyan is running low. Would you like to reorder supplies? You click, you order the supplies, and before the cyan runs out, you have a new cyan. What I found in myself is, whether I'm getting frustrated or cranky about a team that's not doing an effective sprint review, I'm getting frustrated with the executives or something else. And the energy is building up inside of me, negative energy, anger, frustration. First, I got to listen to my body. What happens mm -hmm. when I get cranky? Usually I have tingling here, stomach is tightening, facial expressions change. So first I've got to have transparency. If I'm listening to my body, my body is sending alarms, Ravi. You're about, the genie is about to come out of the bottle. You're going to have a meltdown. You're getting really angry, right? So first I got to listen. And the second is I'm looking at my life and trying to look at it from four tanks. Which tank is missing? The first is sense of purpose. I have a very clear life purpose, which I realized was formed when I was five years old. And if I am living a life which is disconnected from my life purpose, I've got to figure out, okay, is the purpose tank empty? And if it's empty, why is it empty? Is it that my life is disconnected from the purpose or I need to change my purpose? If that's the case, I fill up this tank. The second is sense of progress. Okay, my purpose is okay, but I'm not making progress. Maybe that's a, this tank, sign tank. Okay, so how can I 
make progress? What adjustments do I need? So I don't feel like I'm rolling this rock over the hill and it keeps crushing, crushing me, falling down. The second is sense of choice. So if in Daniel Pink's model, it's purpose, autonomy, mastery. So purpose, the model I use has broken it up into two, purpose and progress. In Daniel Pink's model, the second pillar is autonomy. In this model, it's called choice. Do I have a choice in picking the task I want to achieve my life purpose? If that tank is empty, if I am, for example, if I feel I'm being forced to do taxes in QuickBooks, and I hate doing taxes in QuickBooks. Mm -hmm. I feel I lost choice. Okay, let me outsource. Let me give it to a CPA because that's not the kind of work I want to do. And the last is sense of mastery. This is like our sense of competence. So this is similar to Daniel Pink's purpose autonomy mastery. If I want to be a scrum trainer, I still remember the first scrum training I did. It was horrible. I feel sorry for the people who paid money. For it. <laughs> but I'm still sucking nine years later, but I would like to believe I'm sucking at a higher level. So if I feel that the sense of mastery is lacking, then I have to invest in improving myself. Now, why do I bring up this in Manisha's question? When I looked at why was I getting frustrated with an agile transformation, oh. I had to look at it through these lenses. Is it that I am not an effective coach and I'm not able to help these people understand the why? Or in some cases, these are not the right people. Life is short. You can't help people who are not ready to be helped or who for whom you are not the right fit. So one of the things I've done is I've become very cautious about my pre-sales process. And I want to make sure that whoever I'm going to be working with, they have compatible values. They want to improve and they feel I can help them. So in coactive coaching, there is a technique where you have something known as a chemistry session, where you ask your prospective clients, hey, what does coaching mean to you? What do you want to achieve? How do you see us working together? And you tell them about yourself, and then you design an alliance, and then you take it for a test drive, a short controlled experiment. Uh, I have a blog on this topic, so if you want, we can talk offline, but I have a, a fillable PDF canvas. Manish, I would recommend to you if you have the ability, be very cautious about the kind of people you work with. Life is short. The time you spent will never come back. So for me, that has been the biggest change. I'm very careful about who I work with and make to make sure that our purposes are aligned and our strengths are complementary. Values are congruent and strengths are complementary. So that's my thought. Yeah, we are. Thought. Oh. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, Nigel, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I'm just going to add to what Ravi's saying. And, and I was reading some of the chat as well because Alona says she's not able to walk away. And, and sometimes people aren't able to walk away, but I've got a bit of advice for that as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. I left Toyota in 2019. I got to the point where, despite wearing the shirt still, um, I, I got to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't be bothered to argue and fight anymore. I mean, I was at a senior level. I was at an executive level, but... I got to the point where I could no longer be bothered with trying to convince people of the things that they asked me to help them with. So they asked me for help. I give them the evidence and then they argue why I'm wrong. And, and this, I'm making a very simplif simplified version of what it really was. But I got to the point where the fight wasn't worth it. And, you know, as Ravi says, life's short. You don't get the days back. We're all getting older. We, we, we suffer ailments as we get older. And I started to think, you know, do I want to grow old or die still fighting battles? Or do I actually want to go and enjoy life and do something I enjoy? And the pandemic, of course, taught everybody a lot of lessons about life and making them look inwardly and think about things that we're doing. And of course, the conflict many of you are now suffering is again bringing home the value of life and the value of the time we have left on the planet. And so I, like Ravi, I won't work with people who want to argue now. If they just want to argue, then I'm not interested. If you want me to help you, I'll help you. But when we get to a point where the advice is just falling on deaf ears, I'll walk away. For those that are stuck in a job that's miserable and, and pointless and mindless or some type of work they're doing, which is meaning that they can't walk away because they need the paycheck, my advice is to suffer it and then do all you can to build your profile and to look for opportunities elsewhere. Because trust me, especially now, I mean, 
I'm talking about in the countries that aren't uh, affected by the conflicts or economic problems, there are huge opportunities at the moment. There is, there is more jobs than there are people right now. And so there are opportunities, but don't get yourself trapped into this causal loop which means that you perpetuate the misery that you're in. You've got to find a way to step off that treadmill. And just before I hand over to Artem, the, the thing behind me, this pseudo Kanbanish type display, and my opinions on Kanban are quite fierce, so I'll keep those to myself. But I've, my, I've been a lifelong planner. I used to be a list writer. I'm still a damn list writer. I think all Kanban is a, is a list. And, and effectively, I am constantly writing lists and constantly visualizing. And actually, I find myself when I get overwhelmed, if I pick up a post-it note, set of post notes and a, and a Sharpie and start writing all the things that are in my head, I can then forget about them and go away and relax because I've now recorded them in a way that enables me not to forget about these things. And I really do think these are the two most powerful tools in my toolbox. Artem. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I fully agree with uh, what you are doing with overloading from the uh, offloading, offloading from the RAM memory to to paper, so you can be more focused on the most important thing right now. I'm doing the same when I'm at home, not in the, this uh, temporary place. And what I also want to emphasize on is about to walk away. For me, it's very hard to walk away, especially if I'm truly know that I'm I'm right and my opponent is not right in some situation. So. Uh, it, it, it usually when someone is really telling not the real truth so they're trying to show you from a different perspective it's not about you and you try to prove that no 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 it shouldn't be like that what people will think and once it was in my career that um, doesn't matter where where it was but one team lead was opposing to me because he doesn't want to have an agile coach in this organization and it was like a political fight so to say and he started uh, creating rumors about me and about what I'm doing and what I'm saying and it was totally untrue and unfair and I cannot walk away and I start feeling uh, first symptoms of burning out because I don't want to be on the same meetings where he was present I don't want to help his team uh, because I want to see them fail you know so kind of I be start feeling that I become toxic towards my organization <laughs> and it was a reinforcing loop because I was un what's going on uh, be, because I, I I I feel unhappy that I am starting um, ruin what I was creating before, you know. And one guy, he was a, a bit older than me. He goes uh, for a coffee and uh, see me disappointed, and ask what's going on. Is it related somehow to that conflict? And I said, yeah, it's somehow related. And he helped me with uh, like an unasked uh, unasked coaching, you know. He asked me. Is it the first time in your career you are feeling this, what you are feeling right now, that someone is unfair and telling not the truth about you or your behavior? I said, no, it's not the first time. He said, okay, can you remember the last time when it was so harsh as now? I say, yeah, I can. When it was? I say, like about five years ago, I, 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 I believe. And he said, does it really powerfully impact your nowadays place in the world? Was it so important for you so you cannot just walk away if you will go back to five years ago? Would you do it once again and fight for freedom and waste all your energy and being like unhappy and toxic to people, normal people around and to your relatives and family and so on and so on? I said, probably no. And then he asked, so why are you continuously doing it right now? What, what could help you? And I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> what, what can help you? And I said, yeah, maybe I should be more focused on those people with whom I can collaborate, not just argue in, in yeah, for, for arguing. And that was one of the best moments in, 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 in that uh, part of my career, I believe. So, yeah, thank you, Nigel. You just remind me of that moment. And I'll pass my microphone to Ravi, probably. Yeah, and, and uh, Alona, I love the question. Uh, I want to introduce something I, that helped me uh, from, I learned from C CTI, Coactive Coaching in uh, Training Institute, and they introduced the idea of saboteurs and allies. So a saboteur, and I struggle with this in terms of walking away. A saboteur or one of my coaches said, use the word protector. When it comes to walking away, even though I'm suffering, I am hurting myself, I'm hurting my clients, maybe I'm hurting my family because I'm bringing that back. When I think of walking away, there's a voice on my shoulder 
who's telling me, Ravi, don't walk away. And that voice may have associated walking away with, with something negative. So that voice wants what's good for me. It's like a protector. Maybe that voice says, Ravi, if you walk away, you're a quitter. There you go, Ravi, you're quitting again. You're letting down your clients. And you know what's going to happen pretty soon. You'll be a starving. You'll be a panhandler on the road. Uh, so it could be the voice of my parents. I come from a very humble middle-class family in India. Like you made a commitment. You cannot walk yeah. away. You, you made a commitment. You, you made a promise. Yeah. How you can you do this? How can you do this, Ravi? So that voice is going on. The challenge is it's coming from a good place. It's trying to help me live a life where I honor the promises I made. But what I need to do is there are other voices at my table of advisors who are not being heard. And those are the allies. So in CTI term terminology, they are allies. So what CTI taught me is bring other voices to the conversation. And those other voices can add wisdom, which is currently being ignored. Yeah, I know you made a promise, Ravi. How's that working out? Is it work what was the promise you made? So if the promise was my clients will live an amazing life, they will live their best lives. How's that working out, Ravi? Uh, and what else might be possible? Could we redesign? Could we have a conversation with the client and say, hey, client, I made a promise that this is what I would do. This is what you would do. And this is the beautiful future we'd create. It feels to me that's not working out, but how does it feel to you? So I found a third way. My, when I bring my allies into the conversation, it's not walk away and break your promise or stay and live a horrible life. There's a third way. Let's, let's talk. So anyway, so I, I realize whenever I'm suffering, I have burnout, I am struggling to walk away. There are conflicting signals. There are values which are not being honored. And if I expand the conversation and invite other voices, I get more clarity. Uh, maybe one last thing I want to share. I created this on my, uh, I, I don't know if I have permission to share. Maybe yeah, I do. I want to show you a visual. So I created this in one of my CTI courses. This crystal ball in the middle is my life purpose. I want my clients to be able to look at their future and get so inspired that nothing stops them from living their future. And these are my allies. I want coaching with me to be fun. Uh, I want to use a lot of instruments in my, in my toolkit, like a symphony, like a maestro. Uh, I want my clients, when their saboteurs come in, I want my saboteurs of my clients to be scared of this, this energy. And finally, when I am suffering, I want to call my ally, the sage, who can mediate conversations and bring more wisdom when I'm, when I'm suffering, right? So this is in my, on my wallpaper and this guides me. And my request is see if you can create something similar and in, in, invoke your allies or launch the allies app when you are suffering in life and see what voices are not being brought to the conversation and what values are being ignored. So I just wanted to share that, okay? Now I'll stop. Thanks. Um, I wanted to add um, a few things and maybe, you know, if there's other questions, we can, we can do that too. Um, one of the things, I guess there's been, it, it made me think about the times that I have walked away in my life, whether that has been a job and why I did that. And usually for me, it was when I just didn't want to get up and go anymore and nothing to, to say. Um, I didn't care. And the other ones are relationships when you walk away from a relationship and in the line of business that we are in, these are all about relationships. And so um, from a personal relationship per perspective, um, one of the, the, the questions that I was asked when I said, should I walk away from this relationship was, are you better with or without that person in your life? And that has been something that I'm able to think about when I'm thinking about maybe something I'm doing or whether it's a, 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 it's a person that I'm with, um, a friend I have in my life. And that really leads me to think about boundaries. So one of the things that I even understood now is I can have a boundary, we, you know, 
the, the notion of having boundaries, even with my family or with something is, is a really interesting aspect, uh, perspective to me also, because when we're talking about the individual, it's very counter to Asian culture, right? So it's not, it's not just about the individual, it's about what do we do for the, the group? What do we do with the, for the family? How do we do that? How are we helping everybody? But we can still have a boundary and do those things. I can care about you, but I don't have to care for you for the rest of your life in the way that you expect me to. How do I do that differently? And so these are things that when we start to think about um, those boundaries is if we are making the decision to do something, whether it's because I don't want to walk away because I committed, the question becomes who did you commit to and what did you commit to? Are those people respecting this agreement or is this really about you? Are you um, what I like to call locked in a golden cage, or maybe somebody else said it, it doesn't seem so genius. Are you locked in the gold? You get paid a lot to stay where you are. And so what decision, when you do that, um, are you are you sacrificing? And there's the, the model that I put on LinkedIn when I was posting about this. There's five things when you think about resilience. And so Ravi talked a lot about the meaning in life, right? We know the days are short. So let's put more life into our days. There's meaning in life emotions, the positive emotions that we can feel, um, support that we have, how do we cope with problems, and in general, our physical well-being or how we deal with those things. The interesting thing about what I've, you know, like been getting through is um, it's, it's what my coach, she started this thing called the inside team, but it's really like the Disney movie, kind of what Ravi says, there's all these voices in your head and they're telling you to do different things. They want different things to protect you or whatever it is. Um, and so it's interesting what she's called out. She said, there are characters in your head, the one that wants a lot of power, right? Manisha talked about this, the one that wants control. I want to be right. It doesn't mean that person is wrong. You just got to be aware that that person is the one who's trying to be in the, the, the stage right now. So that's been really interesting to think about balancing those things and how we make decisions and why we're making those decisions. Andre? Yep. Yep. So uh, thanks, Patricia. It was it was what awesome. One more thing that's actually uh, so I came to it a couple of years ago uh, when uh, when I was a consultant on, uh, with with one of my clients, and actually it's related to the topic walk away. Is that I figured out that if you don't take care of yourself, no one will want to take care of you. And it's very, very important also in your job, especially when we are talking about position of scrum master, agile coach, which, which are based on being a servant leader, that you are there for them, is that you still have to find some room for yourself as well. And if you don't take care of yourself in those situations, I don't think there will be a lot of people over there to take care of you. And sometimes even it sucks, it feels horrible to say, okay, I'm sorry, I can do that. I can help you. Sometimes you have to do that in order to keep your sanity, in order, in order to be able to get back to that, you know? The, um, the interesting thing there mm -hmm. is actually the statistics show the people who have the smaller voices in a company or the people who are underrepresented in a company are the ones who suffer more from mental burnout, workplace burnout. So it's the ones like us who are always fighting or the people that aren't seen. Those are the people that usually suffer the most. Yeah, yeah. And, and I clearly, clearly remember a lot of situations where, where, look, when I'm proposing something to, to be changed or I'm showing people, look, we're doing it this way and we can do it this way. I'm not doing it for my sake, right? I'm doing it to improve the whole ecosystem that is around us. And when you're... When, you cannot be heard, okay, you cannot do anything over there, it's perfectly fine to say, well, maybe it's time to change the organization or change the organization, right? And one of the most, so if I can give any kind of advice to a Scrum Master who is starting to work right now, or they have already some of the experience is to find a way, find a model, find what triggers you, for example, to learn how to take care of yourself. That's, yeah. Thank you okay. to everyone who has shared. Yeah. Um, may I jump in and 
ask slash suggest a continuation uh, for for the discussion. Um, everything that you have said really, really resonated with me, uh, but something that Patricia mentioned, you know, um, also opened up to a whole new level. Uh, you touched up upon the balance and I wanted to ask for your, um, well, tips, tricks, uh, practices about getting that uh, balance, you know, not how to not overdo, overcorrect things. And like in situation, like Artem said, where he said, she said something, uh, something happened, how to not overcorrect by just, you know, up and leave and say, oh, to hell with you and, and just go 100% away. Where to find that, how, how to help yourself find that Zen in, you know, not <laughs> send it all to hell, health, but actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um um in general so i'll tell you i'll tell you exactly i was going through a period where i was like i'm going to pay money and invest whether it's a therapist or, or a coach or something like that right i have friends who have done this too and it literally was because i was just ready to set fire to my husband or set fire to the house or like every day it's like i want a divorce or i want to quit my job don't know what's going on right i'm like ah or, and, and it's a lot of situations would cause me to, to flare up quickly. And so I, um, I started work. I have, a, a, you know, great friends like Ravi. I have people who I can talk to. And one day Ravi said to me, I don't remember the exact word, but it was something like, Trish, I think you are rotting away. Something like this, like you are a powerful woman, you're a strong, smart woman, and I feel like you are not, um, you're, you know, you're not, be, you're not being true to yourself. Uh, but truly, it was much more like you're rotten, like that's, that's what I heard, right? And so it was like, I was in this very reactive state. And so I was probably yelling at him. And he was like, Trish, you're like, what's going on here? And so when I started working with the coach, and this is like, you can look it up online. It, they ask you to think about your, um, the wheel of life. Is that what it is, Ravi? The wheel of life and like to rank, how do you think you're doing in those areas? So the first thing was the thing that I thought that I really had to work on was not where I thought I had problems or issues, right? The thing I was trying to solve was, was not actually the thing that was like the craziest going on. And so it's kind of that and awareness that really helped me start out um, and then in general, the, the being reactive or not being as reactive to things is, is really thinking about what, it's almost like trying to just be more present. I still, I still, it's very hard for me, but it's not trying to win. It's not trying to, it's just trying to listen to the question and think about what they're, what they're saying and being more empathetic and compassionate. Those things are really nice to say, it's really hard. Um, and so honestly, there's just a lot that I do where it's more about finding outlets for me to exert myself and also focusing more. So this notion of wanting to win and wanting to have power and being right and moving things in the right, right direction, you gotta look at who that is. Is that, you know, is that, the, um, is that one of your voices from, when you were little, like there's a lot of psychology in it, but let's just say that's, that's, um, that's angry Alana. You're like, she's up there and she serves a purpose, right? When we want to go fight, when we want to do these things, that's what we want. But right now, why is she, why is she here? What is it? And so it's, it's a little bit of that, that helps. Um, and what's also helped me is like, when I have a, a heated conversation, I have it, I'm angry. And then I come back and have a better conversation. It doesn't mean I haven't even addressed the issue. My coach always tells me I should talk through issues. I'm not very good at that. But being able to talk to that person and the experience a little softer makes me feel better. I, I want to add Or something. I just avoid the person. I don't like them. I just don't talk to them anymore. So, so Alona, here's what I realized. When I reach a point where I can't take it anymore and I just feel like walking away, one possibility in my case is vulnerability. I'm like a child. And when I invest in a relationship, I'm vulnerable. And I, it's like, I, I want to have an intimate relationship, whether in, 
whether it's professional, personal, whatever is appropriate in the context where no guards. The problem is I'm an introverted and my Myers-Briggs, I'm an INFP. So I'm an introverted person who values harmony and, and love and relationships. Here's a problem. Introverted people like me have trouble verbalizing their feelings when they get hurt. So what happens is when I get hurt by people, like I'm holding like this and then they hurt me and it's like, what just happened? But I won't tell them. So this person doesn't know that they hurt me and then they hurt me again and they hurt me again. And I have never communicated to them to say, you know what, when you do this, it really hurts me. Could we try something different? I didn't. My fear was if I talk about some of these, the relationship will get screwed. So it's counterintuitive. My saboteur is saying, Ravi, don't say anything. And this could be because I saw a lot of conflict when I was growing up between my parents. And when my parents had a conflict, it never ended well. So my protector is saying, hey, Ravi, remember when you were a child, when you talk about anything delicate, it ends up in a shouting match. It doesn't go anywhere. Don't do that, Ravi. Don't do that. So what's happening is this person is hurting me and hurting me and hurting me. And I'm scared. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And one day I can't take it anymore. And like, screw you. I'm done. So I did not know that's my architecture. So when I don't know the architecture, I can't single step through the code and I can't put a patch. But <laughs> I, you know, I got, I got some assessments and I figured out, oh, so this is what's going on because there's a pattern in my life. Mother, wife, boss, client. At some point, my life coach said, Ravi, you've been having all of these problems. What's common? <laughs> you are common. Would it be okay if we just look at you and not blame others? I was others? going to say women. <laughs> women yes women I, so so that could be something now my my coach told me something else now sometimes you may just decide i'm i'm going to walk away because this relationship is not good the other thing he said was hold the relationship lightly so in some relationships just like you have a child you carry a child and then after some time you get tired you switch to the other hip right or sometimes you cradle your child so my coach taught me that some relationships, you hold them lightly. One solution is be done with it. The other is you adjust. So you're like this. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's at a distance. So he gave, he expanded my spectrum of possibilities beyond I've had it, screw you, I'm done. So that might be, anyway, that's something that I'm exploring and experimenting, but I want to share with that in case it triggered some new insights. I want to... Um just add, uh, so yes, yes, exactly what Ravi is saying, but it takes a lot of steps to get there. Um, one of the things that really helped me in the beginning when I was having a disagreement with, I disagreed with somebody or I felt a certain way, it's very hard for me to do this, but it was to use I statements. So I, um, rather than saying you are a jerk, I feel unsafe when, or I feel something like that. I, I witnessed it change a conversation. I witnessed it change a dynamic. So I'm like, just even with my husband like this about something, right? Uh, Cause we're both a certain, certain type of person. And I would say, you know, I really, I really don't feel safe or I felt scared when this happened and the conversation just changed. And, and I had to consciously say, use an I statement here instead of you're being really loud or you're being really rude or you're this or that like just claim how you feel because that's the only truth that you you know and so like that that's a Ravi's putting it in but I really I really tried that and I saw a difference in how the the the, the experience ha, has changed and I've used that with management I've used that with clients and it really changes the other thing that was really um is really important and it's kind of the walking away is um, a lot of people in corporate environments and um, in, in positions of power, most of them are narcissistic. And so that's just something to keep in mind that the person that you are working with may not care about you, doesn't care, cares about them. And so they can psychologically keep you in a cycle because one, it's fun for them, but two, it's what's kept them in their position of, of power. Um, and that's where, um, there's a book that I read um, 
that's called um, Never Split the Difference. It's written by an FBI negotiator and how he negotiated the hostage situations and all these things. And it's a lot about what we know as agile coaches and scrum masters. So it's called Never Split the Difference. You could probably just follow him on Instagram and see what he talks, but he talks about empathy. So instead of asking like the closed questions or even a why, it's using a what question or a how, how would, how would we do that? What is the, because what you're doing by doing those things is getting the other person thinking about how they solve that situation rather than just putting them in a, in a defensive state, you're getting them thinking about the, the issue. And so those are some just small tips that might be, um, might be nice, but I, I really should like reflect on this more. I've talked about it with my coach, but like my um, desire to set things on fire has, has decreased. Uh, so it's, it is, it is something that's worked. Just this yeah, feeling of reaction, just angry. It doesn't feel good, you know, but it's this, this person you, you, you're known to be, I'm super strong. I'm going to get it. It changes. And yeah, maybe one last thing imbalance. My life coach taught me that imbalance occurs in life when some voice is not being heard. And that's similar to the allies conversation. And I shared, I, I shared a, a link to the system that my life coach taught me. It's about the archetypes. So if you look at this, chances are when there is imbalance in your life, it's possible one of these voices are not at your round table. So imagine you are the queen of your kingdom or king of the kingdom, and you have a round table of advisors, like King Arthur had a round table. And maybe when you feel like, screw it, I want to burn it, maybe the warrior is dominant. Because the warrior has reached the conclusion, we've got to burn this down. But perhaps what might be missing is Maybe the lover or the seeker, curiosity. I wonder what's going on. So one possibility is when you are feeling the leading indicators, then you ask yourself, which of my advisors am I not listening to? Which of my advisors in the, is in the Zoom waiting room or got blocked from Zoom? How can I invite the right advisor? And I don't have to do what they say, but I want to consult them and make an informed decision. So curiosity has been a great force in my life to create balance. Because when I get angry, then I'm the judge, jury, and executioner. When I am curious, I'm like, hmm, I love this person. This person loves me. We want to be in a good relationship, but we're not able to figure it out. I wonder what's going on. When I choose the stance of curiosity, who I am being, how I'm breathing, how my body language, facial expression, tone, everything changes. And when I come from a stance of curiosity, the trajectory of the conversation changes. So anyway, some tools, hope some of some, something helps. As, as we say these things, one of the things that I learned also was don't deny who you truly are, right? Like I, I was like, I'm not going to be snuggly and huggy and love and all those things because I just wasn't brought up that way. And, and, and you don't, don't change who you are. We're how it, it that doesn't mean, for instance, as agilists that we don't care about power. We don't care about respect. We don't care about those things. Or, you know, if you are someone who loves humor and laughing and making jokes, it doesn't mean you have to be all of a sudden serious. It's it's just understanding that there's all these different um, aspects. And so it's 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 interesting. Love to hear from others. I just want to make a quick add. So, for example, like uh, in the statement, when this happens, it makes me feel this. When this happens, my experience, which is communication. It's also important to have the courage to start that communication. And then you might be surprised. It will bring some respect with that in the team uh, to resolve conflict. And then... A personal experience, something that helped me, let's say, get out of a stressful situation or burnout or just throughout the day is during COVID, they closed the gyms, okay? And you couldn't go in. So after a meeting or after a task or some disagreement, when I had to take a step back and take a deep breath, I would do 10 push-ups. And then I would mark it. And by the end of the day, I've, I've done a good number. 
Uh, and, and that, of course, uh, stimulates uh, chemicals in the brain doing that and uh, for quite a good day. I will not be doing the push-ups, but that, thank you for that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like working out has really uh, been something that's helped me through, through COVID. And, you know, as I was listening to David, he said, David, was, there was such an insightful comment. I have to feel safe. I, I, I have to feel safe to bring up that topic. I have to be vulnerable. And one thing that reminded me is sometimes we have to make the soil fertile before we plant, put the plant. Otherwise, if you don't do it, the plant will die. And it reminded me of something I learned in ORSK training. It's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, it's based on Gottman's research on, I think it's the largest empirical study of couples over maybe 20 years. And uh, the people who created ORSK, they feel that the lessons that, are pre that were discovered in the context of personal, intimate personal relationships also apply, can be transferred to a professional context, to a non-intimate uh, situation. And what David's comment reminded me was, it's possible that if you want, if you're longing to be vulnerable and demonstrate courage, but you are scared that when you make yourself vulnerable and you expose yourself, it's actually going to cause you more hurt. One possibility is you can look at your relationship through the lens of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There are four factors that can harm relationships. And then you can put the antidotes. The four factors are criticism, contempt, defensiveness and stonewalling. And if you feel the reason I'm, I want to be vulnerable, but I can't, you can look at your relationship through these four lenses and ask yourself, is it that one of these factors is preventing me from being vulnerable? And if so, then there's a second block, which is the antidotes. You start making the soil fertile and then you create the space where then you can feel safe to be courageous. So I put a couple of links there in case they help you. Thank you, David. Thank you. I'm going to drop this. Um, there's something that's called, it's, it's more in terms of child psychology, um, but it's, it's really about these components and everything's connected. You know, all these models are kind of based off of this stuff of um, things that, that work on making us resilient. Um, and so, um, competence, confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping, and control. And what it was making me think about was that as we take on these different stances, and it's very similar maybe to like, you know, Ravi had, had, had the logos up and thing is, is to ask us when we're trying to be, um, when we're trying to show up in a certain way, is to think about, or when we find ourselves stuck, like we want to be in this situation, I would say, think about maybe why is this working for you? What makes you stay? What makes you attached to a certain habit? What makes you continue to working, continue working for a company, for a team? What, are, what keeps you doing these things or keeps you um, acting a certain way with your children? What does it satisfy? And then just say, hey, is that okay? Hmm. I don't know how about you, but I feel so much better right now. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing the insights and thank you very much for sharing uh, the links. You're welcome. You're not alone, that's for sure. <laughs> we have like 15 minutes left and uh, it was an awesome discussion and we were right now focused on mm -hmm. us, right? But as Scrum Masters and Agile Coaches, almost interesting part would be how could we react if somebody approaches us and says for, for example from the team hey i don't feel that well or hey i might be experiencing burnout maybe you guys have any recommendations for that or the tips or maybe you you witness something like that in your uh, in your career yeah um so yes. one of the things that i have i like I'm engaging with people enough and I've seen it and I've suggested it. And what 
study shows is that even though we suggest it, people don't feel that comfortable, especially during COVID and all this stuff or with other things going on. They're just like, let me focus on work. It distracts me from other, let me do these things. And uh, there are a couple of things that I've, I thought um, that, well, what I've done and that I thought was really cool is like, Andre, you have step, had stepped away and you said, I need to do this because it helps me be professional. I'm not bringing, and that I think is an elevated way of thinking, right? For me, some of the things that I've done is I've just been like, hey team, I am taking a mental health break. I'm taking, and that's, that's not like, I just need, I just need, I'm gonna take the rest of the day off, I'm out. And by me doing that, um, um, it let them know that, they could do the same thing too, right? Just somebody has to show that they'll do it. And um, that was me just being, I don't know, vulnerable is the word or just, you know, non-negotiable. It's just somebody did it first. Yeah, my, my go-to question is how can I support you? I learned in CTI, the best open-ended questions should be five words long, preferably no longer than seven words. Sometimes that's what people want. How can I support you? Because our architecture design is different. God made all of us different. So if I try to guess, and if I try to do un, unto others as I would like to be done unto myself, it may not work. I may be an Intel architecture that might be like an Apple, right? So instead of guessing, I just say, uh, Ken Schwaber says, ask the team. Somebody came to me because they are hurting. They want something from me. My job is, how can I support you? Somebody might say, you know, man, there's nothing you can do. Like there's nothing I can do for the people in Ukraine, but I reached out to you guys just to let you know, I'm feeling for you, man. And sometimes you got to fight your own fight, but that's all you needed. I mean, that's all I can offer you, right? So my suggestion is ask, how can I support you? And then do the best you can. Yeah, I've, I've been in a very similar situation to what you just described, Andre. So just imagine 29th of December, and one of the key developers from four teams that we have a key working on the one common big product in financial tech come to me and say like, uh, you know, uh, I've read my contract with company and there is an end date of a contract, uh, 31st of December. So it means that from 1st of January, I am free. And I said, no, no, it's just a formality. There is another statement that if both sides are not against that this contract will be after prolonged. So keep calm. Everything will be continued. He said, no, 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 no. I'm asking before because, you know, I feel that I'm done. But yeah, I'm finished all important high, high priority assignments. And if my contract is also finished, then I want to say that you shouldn't wait for me in the office from the 1st of January. And I was like, what? <laughs> and you know, he was not the most extrovert in our team. He was the kind of a guy who say hello in the morning and say goodbye at 6 p.m. And also can answer some direct questions which were like addressed to himself. In all other time, he was sitting in headsets and just writing a code. And I say like, okay, do you want to finish our collaboration and to retire to to change the job he said no no no. I, I don't want to change the job i respect our clients i respect customers i love this team but my contract is finished and my energy is very very low so i am not ready to continue working here if, if it's possible because the contract is finished and it's just the end of our story together and i was totally shocked because i have nothing to do and he's a critical bus factor in our team so sasha please can you can you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. This can. is my younger su supporter. It's all good. So, it's all good. Yeah. It's fine. I I cannot I cannot hear myself. You know. <laughs> so yeah, and I was like, okay. Uh, and why are you asking me about this uh, next steps just right now? Maybe a few weeks ago. And he said like, uh, because the contract almost finished, and now it's time to speak. So what I've done? I said, okay, give me just a few minutes. Can I help you somehow? He said, no, just tell me what to do next. I said, okay, then I will ask, go and ask my manager. My direct manager was head of country and I goes to him and he was packing his uh, snowboard to, <laughs> to package <laughs> being ready for a ski resort because it's 29th of December. 
And I like, ah, oh, hello, Artem. He's also Artem. He said, ah, oh, hello. I say, I have one question to you because you are my manager and you should help me to remove impediments and answer on the most tough questions. Yeah, he said, yeah. Like, I have a, one developer. He's a full stack with seven years on this product. So he was quite experienced in the domain and clients love him. And he want to go away because contract is almost finished. He said, no, it will be after prolonged. I say, done. We've discussed it already, but... He wanted to go because contract is almost finished. He said, I can print another contract for him for five years. Just give it to him for sign. I said, no, he, he is not ready to sign another contract. And he asked, does he want to leave the job? I said, no, he don't want to be treated as a traitor. So he doesn't want to leave the job. He wants to finish <laughs> job with, which is already done by, by his perception. He said, I, I don't know how to speak with this crazy software people. Go and do your job. <laughs> I, I, I move back and I start asking like, okay, why wh why it's so important for you to finish? And he starts explaining that he doesn't want to offense anyone. That's why he doesn't want to leave the job like wallets. How, how to say it in English? Quit. Quit. To quit. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't want to quit because it's not what he wanted to. He wants to stay in a good relationship with guys. It, and if nobody is against, he wants to visit office every Thursday evening when we uh, sometimes get some drinks together, you know. So Thursday evening for party. But he's not ready to work because he has his own uh, pet project. He likes to learn more about uh, Docker and all this stuff. And at that moment, it wasn't part of our technologies. And he doesn't have enough energy uh, to contribute in, in, the, in the team as much as he wanted to. And then I proposed to him like to go for 50% of time. He, he rejected. I proposed to take a break for a month, maybe for two months, with a place uh, kept for him. He re rejected and I asked, okay, what do you propose? Maybe you have some proposal. And he said, I am not ready to take money for not uh, fully contributing and not working for full time, but I don't have time to work for full time. So if it's possible, I can contribute when I have time and desire as an open source. But please don't pay me for that. <laughs> can you imagine? He said, because I don't want to go for burnout. I have another hobby and medical treatment and my uh, this new project. But I don't want to create a problem for my team. So we were in a very, very, not, not with very hard communication negotiation with client to explain what's going on because it was also outsourcing and fintech, so it's not very easy. But clients say, "Okay, what do you propose?" We say, "NDA is signed. We can keep him as a contractor, but he will contribute as much as he wanted to, if you don't mind, as an individual consultant for the team, and we will create some plan how to." Uh, transfer the knowledge from this guy and it was the only thing I can do in this situation I still not sure are there any other exits from this labyrinth <laughs> but but you remind me this this session because he was almost burned out and never sign uh, ne never shows any signs of, uh, signs of it before on one-on-ones on other sessions so we, he was very quiet but one day 29th of December just a Christmas uh, gift you know so yeah, ask them why, why they're making this decision. What is really important for them? How can I support them on this way? What can we do even crazy from first uh, look at it? So yeah, what, what do you really want? Like, like uh, Lucifer in the TV show, yeah? T tell me, what is your truly native desire, my friend? And maybe he or she will tell you. I think Femi, you had, Femi yeah. had a hand raise. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone, and thanks for the wonderful ideas of Patricia and Ravi. I just wanted to kind of um, relate to what uh, Patricia said earlier about kind of modeling the behavior that you would like the team to adopt. So say, for example, you want the team to take time off more often, then you be the, the model and, you know, you take time off and say, you know, I'm, I had it today, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the rest of the day off. And in terms of uh, building trust in teams, how I use that is, is, try, is to be vulnerable. So I share kind of safe but personal things about myself, things I'm going you know, on with my son, uh, with my, my partner where applicable, or even things I like to learn. Um, 
So by doing that, I kind of use that to open spaces for the team members to be able to share and learn to gradually trust each other as well. I also use it with new product owners when I don't want to jump into a session and start coaching them. On, um, so I like um, situational coaching. Uh, but one of the ways I do that is to kind of, I know it's not ethical, but actually pretend as if I don't understand some things about the product. And then by making myself vulnerable that way, it opens an opportunity for me then to be able to say, hey, thank you for sharing that idea with me. I have something else I'd like to share with you. Is that okay? Uh, so this is how just, I think we, we should take that step forward and be vulnerable first with people. And then they will trust you and be, um, be prepared to be vulnerable with you as well. So I just wanted to uh, loop in on what um, uh, Patricia said earlier. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's, that's something that I actually, back to kind of the conversation with Alana, it was, um, it's something that I, cause it's not my natural stance is something that you really have to make a step to try, especially when you're in a combative uh, situation to, that, that you interpret to be combative, but it's just something you're not, somebody you're not comfortable with, is try to model a little bit more of a, come with a little bit more um, of, of that position. And um, I was thinking from, from Artem's, um, from Artem, what he was talking about, it made me think about what, what an awesome human being you're dealing with because if he wasn't that logical he would have that feeling of being stuck where i think a lot of other people especially overachievers we always feel stuck what is that next i feel stuck where am i supposed to be what's that next thing i have to go forward and he was just so clear about what he wanted and that's so cool okay is that sasha oh. hi sasha this is the best part of the webinar for me. Hi, Sasha. How are you? I'm mildly offended. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So it's been 90 minutes and our time box is expiring. And I think it's a good actually place to, to wrap up. Uh, Patricia, Ravi, thanks a lot. I think it was valuable by the amount of the conversation. It was one of the most liveliest meetups. It was cool. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot to all of the participants that uh, had also the courage to ask the question and share their uh, personal stories. It was awesome. Uh, remember to donate. Uh, for the next week, our initiative is not going to have any events, but, but stay tuned. We're going to have some awesome news next week. Okay, so we you know what is very interesting that that we are saying that from the next week there are no events after the topic about burnout. <laughs> it's good. We need to so we are, we are finishing first no. sprint of we're the marathon giving, with the burnout. We're giving, we're giving you some time to get even more hungry yeah. for the for the event that yeah. we're gonna have in the future. And stay tuned with us. We're gonna have some more news. And once again, Patricia and Ravi, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Cool. Stay thank connected. You. Thank, Thank you. you so very much for yes, this bye. soulful conversation. Sorry, Femi. Sorry. Apologies. <laughs>